Praise God. Praise God. There is nothing like the house of God on Wednesday night. Amen. Hey, I just saw that, uh, that plug for women's conference. Where are the ladies at in the room? Come on. Yes. We've got the sign up ready to go. You can go ahead and sign up for that now. If you've not done that, go ahead. Start doing that. Get prepared. It's going to be an incredible, incredible event. Uh, I hope you guys are excited about tonight's message. This is the final week in our unexpected series. We've been doing this for a couple of weeks now. And uh, I have the last three of the fruit of the Spirit for you tonight. And so I'm excited to teach these. And, uh, you know, we go through some unexpected things in life, don't we? Some things we didn't know were coming, don't we? Some of you guys are facing this stuff right now in your very life at this moment. I'm thankful that you're here in the house of God. I'm so glad that you're here in the house of God because I believe God's going to bring a word to you tonight, one that's going to touch your heart, one that's going to pierce through to divide soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It'll be a a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. God is going to do something in your heart tonight. He's going to bring a fresh, fresh wind into your life. You may have felt dried up. He's going to start a fresh well in your heart. There'll be rivers of living water coming out of you tonight in Jesus Christ's name, church. So let's pray and just begin to believe God's doing it. Lift your hands to heaven in this room tonight. Father, we bless you. Go ahead and just bless him with your words. Father, we bless you in this place. Father, we magnify you here. We say you're Alpha, Omega, beginning, end, first, last. You're everything, Father God. You're bigger than any situation. You're, Lord, you're, you're not, you don't see unexpected like we do. Our unexpected, Father God, it doesn't catch you off guard. And so we thank you tonight, Lord, that we can lay all of those concerns, all of those cares at your feet because you care for us. You've not given us a spirit of fear, but no power, Father God. You've given us power, love, and of a sound mind. We thank you that we are thinking straight in these situations. Even in the midst of tribulation, you promise peace. So now I pray, tonight I pray your peace would pour out upon us. Just pour, just pour out your peace, Father. Right there, it's already happening right now in this room. It's almost like a warm balm of, of Gilead just coming upon your head right now, all the way from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. We bless you, Lord. And we thank you for the peace that surpasses all of our earthly understanding. We bless you in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen, amen, amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap tonight. Praise God. So we have been discussing how Christians handle uh, unexpected and really, really handle what we call tribulations because Jesus talked about it. We saw it in John chapter 16. It's our core verse. It's our really, our focus scripture. I want to read that to you to start the night off. And so if you have a Bible, open up to that and let's look at the reading of the word now. It says this, these things I have spoken to you that you may have peace in the world. You will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I love this part where he says, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Isn't it amazing that Jesus Christ has overcome on your behalf? Anything that you can experience, he has overcome it for you. It's already been done 2,000 years ago. He has overcome for you. You're more than a conqueror. Right now, God's taking care of you. And, and you know, there's these situations that come against us, these tribulations, these unexpected things, they happen to us all the time. And we don't handle them like the world handles them, or do we? Sometimes we fall back a little bit and take, take a background, take a back step in this situation, but we're not supposed to handle these things like the world handled them. The world will hand it, handle it with panic. The world will handle it with fear and uncertainty, and they'll be scared of these situations. But Christian, you do not have to live in fear. You are more than an overcomer. And we have been given the attributes of the Spirit. They dwell richly within us, and we can operate with those in the midst of every single unexpected tribulation that comes into our life. Now, I think of a time in my life where, this is about 10 years ago, uh, my wife and I, we were, uh, we had one vehicle, one vehicle, uh, we had, we had, uh, gotten rid of one of them. And so we had one vehicle driving around in a Toyota Tundra. I actually had it until about last year. It caught on fire for the last time. So we finally got rid of it. And we decided, uh, decided to get something else. So uh, praise the Lord, we were blessed. And, um, but at this season of our life, it was about a, a year season where we had just one vehicle. Uh, we were starting off in ministry. I was highly blessed. Uh, I don't want to act like we didn't have what we needed. We had what we needed. But we chose a lifestyle where Steve would stay with the children and uh, took care of those babies. And, I had, and we were taken care of, but we just worked with the one car. It was great. And finally, someone came to us and said, hey, we want to give you a vehicle. 
And I was like, that's incredible. That's incredible. We're going to get a free vehicle. And they said, but it doesn't work. And we're like, okay, well, we'll see what we can do. So I, and I wasn't a mechanic at all. And so I thought, this is a great opportunity. This is a blessing, but I don't see the blessing as monetary. I see the blessing as something I can learn. I can learn how to work on this vehicle. I can learn how to le- learn how to do some mechanic things that I've never known how to do before. I didn't grow up doing that. I didn't know how to do that. And so I took it as an opportunity to learn. This was a Volvo 83 940 station wagon Volvo. It was my favorite car that I've ever owned, to be honest with you, besides maybe a, a, a 91 Camaro when I was a kid. But this thing was awesome. All right. It had a sunroof. Uh, none of the windows hardly worked. Uh, no AC. <laughs> and uh, it had some issues. But... I called a good friend, he came over. Whenever we got to the house, he took a, a cable, lifted it up over the throttle body and put it on and said, try it now. And it worked. The cable was just off the throttle body. The guy didn't even bother to look under the hood. So we got the vehicle working. We drove this thing around for some time. And of course, it's an 83. This is a Swedish made vehicle. So uh, you can work on these things. And so uh, they did that because things break down and they're gonna last a while. So I was able to work on this thing from time to time. And one time... I started working on the gas pump. The gas pump went out. And they made these things with a gas pump inside of the tank, and you couldn't drop the gas tank to get to it. You had to go in through the gas tank uh, uh, in the cab. And and I decided, I'm going to try to fix this thing. And I'm telling you, this was unexpected in my life to have to do this. And, and it was hot outside. The windows don't roll down in this thing. And I'm in this car trying to reach my ogre hands inside of this tiny gas tank and pull out a device to replace it. And it did not work. I couldn't get it to work. You got to have it in there just perfect. And I'll tell you, this to me was tribulation and almost the great tribulation, really. I felt that way. I thought, this is horrible. This is the worst thing I've ever done in my life. Uh, And I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes we can behave like the world whenever we have trouble. Sometimes we can behave like the world whenever we have situations go on in our life that we can't control. And in this situation, your pastor is going to admit something to you. I fell back a little bit. I, I, I have not, uh, uh, since then, I, I, I don't have a potty mouth, but at that time, I believe I fell backwards in that area. <laughs> I tell people, I, I don't cuss unless I'm working on a vehicle, okay? Are y'all judging me right now? This is a dr- judge-free room, okay, people, all right? I'm kidding, I'm kidding. No, really, uh, I, had a, I had a situation that day. I had to work on it. But the unexpected happened, and I chose to react by using uh, the works of the flesh, And I didn't operate in the virtues and the attributes of the Holy Spirit that the Lord blesses us with so richly to help us overcome tribulation in our life. These things come to us by the the virtue and by the blessing of the Holy Spirit. And, um, you know, it was a tough time for me to to deal with that. And, And, but you know what? It could be worse, couldn't it? It could be worse. Situations get, could get a lot more hairy than just changing out a gas pump when you've never done it before. Not having enough vehicles uh, that you think that you need. You know, Jesus offers peace in the midst of these situations, but he also promises us tribulation. So without a shadow of a doubt, you are going to face tribulation, church. Jesus said it. You can take it to the bank. It's just how are we going to operate after this? You see, we can receive peace along with other godly attributes to help with this stuff. And that comes from the Holy Spirit, who is the helper. We understand that he is the helper. Amen. And as I said, this tribulation was was big to me, but it would be small to a mechanic. So you may be going through things in your life right now that you think are the greatest tribulation you'll ever face, but I promise you, it could get worse. And and that's that's just to say, hey, listen, don't, don't think too terribly on these situations. I really believe this. Last week, we touched it just a little bit. We talked about the great tribulation in comparison to tribulation. It was really fresh because Pastor preached an incredible message and, and talked about the Antichrist. How many of you guys were thankful to hear a great message like that? I think it was just a couple Sundays ago. Give the Lord a hand clap if you're grateful for that message. He touched notes about um, the end time, and we talked briefly about a seven-year period that is, uh, that is uh, consistent in scriptures. You can see it in the Word all over. And uh, those times in the word are a seven-year tribulation. It's called the great tribulation. Jesus makes reference to it. You can all see it and also see it in Romans chapter seven as well. Jesus makes reference to it in uh, Matthew chapter 26. You can see it. And this great tribulation that's coming against us that, that may be in our lifetime. You know, we say Jesus is coming soon. Wickedness is multiplying. The love of, of many are growing cold right, as now, right now as we speak. There's been a great falling away. We've already seen it in the church world. So we can see these things. The signs of the times are happening before our very eyes. 
And the point I wanted to make uh, that I really didn't make last week, I kind of alluded to it, was that if we can't handle the tribulations that we're facing today, how could we ever handle the great tribulation? We've got to be prepared to say, I'm not going to fall into the works of the flesh whenever I'm dealing with a gas pump on a Volvo. So that if we go through the great tribulation, I'm not saying I know exactly what we're going to go through. I'm not saying I'm post-trib, mid-trib, or pre-trib. I don't know when Jesus is coming back. I just know he's coming back. Amen, church. He is returning for his children, and he is going to perfect everything. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be wonderful. But we've got to hold out until that time. We've got to make sure and be solid in our faith until that time. We've got to understand it. Tribulation will come. These are great tests and great battles for us to, to, to beat right now so that we can beat the ones in the future. Just see it like that. Pastor Jesse was talking about practice. You know, this is like practice for something. You know, life right now is practice for those, those moments in life. And we got to be prepared. It could be worse. And I promise you, according to scripture, scripture it will get worse. I don't want to doom and gloom it tonight, but I'm going to say this and I'll move on to some more lighter tones. I will say, uh, you know, it's going to get worse. If you go back in time, people say, man, it's worse than it's ever been. Not really. Let's look back at Rome and the time where Jesus walked the earth and after he died and rose again, the first couple of centuries after Christ died and rose again were hellacious for Christians. Does anyone remember a guy by the name of Nero in history class? All right, Nero did some terrible damage to Christians. You see, um, in about 74 AD, 64 AD, he, uh, uh, Rome burnt. And a lot of people think that actually Nero burnt it down so he could build a new Rome. He wanted a brand new Rome. He didn't want the old situations. He didn't want the old systems. He wanted new. He wanted better. And so when he did that, he actually blamed the Christians for burning down Rome. And then what happened was an onslaught against Christian faith and against the Christian community. Uh, there's actually people who believed and they knew. Most of the people that time scholars say knew that Nero, or knew that Christians did not, knew it, did, did not do it, but Nero had said they had done it so that he could come against them. It's written by, uh, by historians. Uh, Nero persecuted Christians so severely that sometimes he would place uh, animal, uh, uh, animal hides upon them and, thro uh, and throw them into the Colosseum to be eaten by other animals. Have you ever heard of a, uh, a Roman candle? Roman candle, uh, the name actually comes from where he would actually light Christians aflame and they would be the fire that provided the light for the public events. It could be a lot worse, church. And you can stand in the day of tribulation and you can stand in the day of great tribulation. I want you to, I want to, I want you, after hearing things like that, you kind of go, my goodness, what's coming for me? We know the word, we know what it says, but a great thing is one time I got a word and actually, Pastor Jesse got the word from a, a, another lady. She was a prophet of, uh, she was a prophet, prophetess, and she was married to a prophet, I believe, but uh, was worried, uh, we were all worried about the end days and what kind of tribulation we would have to face. And I remember struggling with this for a time, thinking, man, I don't want to be traumatized. I don't want to be tortured for my faith. And I remember, Pastor Jesse, you gave this word, and, it, and I was dealing pretty toughly with it for like a week. I was like, man, what? What about my children? What about my wife? And she said that no one connected to his church in the camp of his church will ever be tortured for the gospel. I loved that word and it was incredible. And I took that word to heart that day and the fear just came off of me at that moment. So I want you to know that. That's a beautiful word and that's for you. You are at his church campus. Now it doesn't mean you won't be martyred one day, but I praise God that it'll be quick and easy in Jesus name, amen. We are going to stand for the gospel in any case. See, we have to be prepared for this type of thing, church. If we don't ever talk about these situations that can happen during the great tribulation and you're not aware of what could possibly happen, you might not even prepare for that moment. We got to know that we know that we know that we'll stand in the end day. And maybe even ask the questions, if this happens to me, what will I do? Well, I don't know. Well, maybe you should know. Maybe I should know what's going to happen to me and how I'm going to respond in the day of tribulation. Thank God we are not in the day of great tribulation. We are dealing with tribulation that Jesus said we will certainly have. You know, we, uh, uh, we can overcome these experiences through Christ Jesus and through the helper that he's left behind. John, uh, John 16, 7, Jesus said these words. He said, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. 
Did you know you have the helper living on the inside of you? Did you know you have the helper living on the inside of you? You called all the name of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. You are the temple of the living God. He is with you and he will help you in every single situation. We overcome unexpected events in our lives by relying on the Holy Spirit and letting those gifts manifest in our actions, in our words, in our deeds, in everything that we do. You know, one temptation is to begin to rely on a man or a woman to bring complete peace into your life versus the Holy Spirit. What's happening when we do this is we're setting ourselves up to have a greater tribulation. Now, that problem might not be too bad for you to deal with with Jesus. But if, if you're dealing with that situation and the person that you rely on in your life takes off or abandons you in the moment or does not help you in the moment, that tribulation is going to be that much more severe. But if you're having a trouble in your life and you have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you, he will help you in the midst of that situation no matter what. He'll never leave you. Jesus will never forsake you. Believe it or not, your spouse is going to mess up. They're going to say the wrong thing. They're going to do the wrong thing. Their reactions to certain things is going to be wrong. Your children are going to do that. Your parents are going to do that. Your boss is going to do that. Your pastor might do that. We might all leave you and mess you up a little bit. But guess what? The Holy Spirit will never leave you nor forsake you, church. He'll always be by your side. He'll always help you. I promise you, the word does not lie. God is not a man that he would lie. That is the temptation, though, to, to rely on a person. To rely on a person, be it your husband, wife, boss, son, friend, whoever it is. Thank God the Holy Spirit is our helper. Amen? You know what he does, though? He brings us some great gifts. And these gifts we've been talking about the last two weeks that we've met about uh, the unexpected. And uh, I want to read them to you. Galatians 5, and 23, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit, come on. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. It says against such there is no law. It's a beautiful thing that the Holy Spirit gifts us. See, they're called the gifts of the Spirit because when you have the Holy Spirit, these things are in operation in your life. We don't do these things to be Christians. These things come out of us because we are Christians. You don't have to check the box every day that you've been gentle, so you're a Christian today. No, you're a Christian because you believe in Jesus. You have the blood of Jesus covering you. These things come out of you if you're a Christian. Now, some days are tougher than others. Some days you might be working on a 940 Volvo, but God will take care of you and God will make sure these things uh, stay in your life because the Holy Spirit's in your heart. Uh, when the unexpected happens in our life, we have the bend to choose the work of the flesh. And I talked about that earlier. I'm going to read what the works of the flesh is, and then I'm going to get into these fruit of the Spirit that we're going to talk about today. I want to remind you of the works of the flesh. It says this in Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outburst of wraths, Selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. These are the works of the flesh. These are our carnal natures. This is the bend that we have to, to respond in the tough situations and the tribulations. But we find ourselves with the Holy Spirit. Amen? In week one, we talked about any situation, any tribulation that could come against you, yourself, and so we said to combat that, you had peace, you had love, and you had self-control. We talked about those in depth. Week two, we had any situation that you may face, a uh, period, with tribulation. You can combat that with joy, patience, and faithfulness. And this week, I'm excited uh, that we're going to talk about situations and tribulations you may face with others, specifically with others, and how you can handle that and how you can overcome tribulation and tough times with gentleness, come on, kindness and goodness. The three that are probably the hardest to preach we save for last. These are tough. These are probably the hardest attributes to actually do as well. To be kind to people, to be gentle, to be good. These beautiful attributes adorn like a crown on the head of a Christian. I'm telling you right now, when I see someone operating in gentleness, when I see someone operating in kindness, it is a beautiful sight to see. Have you ever known a Christian 
or better yet, not even a Christian, someone who just has a gentleness about them. Have you ever known that person and, and, and just been like, man, this, this is incredible that they behave like this in, in the midst of turmoil. It's a beautiful spirit that, that God has given us. Gentleness and kindness. I know people like that. And honestly, I see them and I say, man, that's, those are my, I, I admire those type of people. Those are my favorite type of people because I need somebody just to be kind to me sometimes because I might not be so kind. I need somebody to be gentle with me sometimes and teach me how to be gentle. I need somebody to walk out goodness in front of me so I can learn how to be good. And they do this very beautifully. There's several people in my life that do that. My mother's one of those guys. I know and a couple other people. Uh, I was just talking to Pastor Jesse the other day about a person in our Owensboro campus. So kind, so sweet. And I, I always love just to, Steve and I, we love to get around her. Just, she's so kind and so sweet. It's Miss Kim in the other campus. We love her so much. She's so kind and so gentle. But I want to mention some of these to you, and I want to go into depth on these. The first one is gentleness. Everybody say gentleness. I'll say it like you mean it. Say gentleness. The scripture comes out of Colossians 3. 12 through 14, I want to read this. It, it matches up beautifully. It says this, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. You see, in here it said meekness. Meekness. This is another word for gentleness. It's actually the English definition. You can see it says this, the fact or condition of being meek, submissiveness. That is gentleness. The fact or condition of being meek. Now, this isn't only something that we express to other people, gentleness. Let's just say with your children, this is one of the greatest examples of being gentle that I can explain to you. Is that when I had my first daughter, things changed in my life. Uh, I was probably a little bit more straight to the point before I had my first daughter, before she could conceptualize and speak. Now I understand I need to be gentle with my daughter. My son, a little bit different. My daughter, there's a gentleness there. And it's important. It's important to behave that way with our daughters and really to behave that way with anybody. But it's not something we only need to express towards man or towards our daughters, our sons, our family, our whoever it is. Gentleness is also expressed towards God in the form of submissiveness, being meek in heart, submiss submitting to what God is asking you to do in the situation. It's not always easy. Uh, uh, the gent uh, this gentleness is the bond with humanity or, or lowliness. J Jesus really showed us this. Jesus embodied this. The writer of Hebrews said this in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. He says, but we see Jesus. Come on, Jesus Christ. We see Jesus who was made a little lower, uh, who, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. He's the Son of God. He is part of the Trinity, the Godhead, and he came down a little lower than the angels. That is meekness. That was submissiveness to the will of God. It was also the heart of Christ Jesus. Now, sometimes I hear people say, it's crazy how, you know, atheists will say this, I can't believe you believe in a God that would send his own son to the cross, who would make his son die for someone else can't believe you would believe in a God like that. Well, here's the thing. Jesus had the same heart. And Jesus didn't go because God said go. He went willingly because he loves us so very much. He submitted to the Lord and to the will of God. And God's asking us with our gentleness towards him to do the same thing in our life. To submit to what he has for us. Amen. Uh, Paul, writing to a young pastor, tells him in 2 Timothy 2, 25 through 26, he says this, in humility, you see there's a, denote, uh, there's a, uh, there's a denoting of humili uh, uh, being humble and being gentle. Being humble. Because being, Jesus came lower than the angels. You see, sometimes we just have to, we have to bend down to get on that, those kids' levels, right? That's a gentleness right there instead of being over. And now we can take that to any scale of our life to say we need to come to a different level sometimes. We need to go to a different place to, to match someone's gentleness in that situation. See, Paul wrote to this pastor in 2 Timothy uh, 2, 25 through 26. He says, in humility, 
correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. See, the enemy is, is, is he's roaming around right now, seeking whom he may destroy. He's like, a, he's like a roaming lion right now, just seeking whom he may destroy at this very moment. He wants to take you out. And sometimes he's, he'll make people go astray. He'll give them the temptation and that person will follow that temptation according to their own carnal desires. Once that temptation is born, it gives birth to sin. And once sin is fully grown, it, gives, it brings death. And that's what he wants. But there's a chance for us in between that to take and change course right before temptation turns into sin, right before it gives birth to sin. But we have to say, okay, I understand this is sin. But we also have to be available to be humble and to be graceful in correction. Now, I say that word and that there's a complete, there's an aversion within us. Don't you feel that? Your carnal nature just kind of goes, ah, oh, I don't like to hear that word correction. And I say that on purpose tonight because usually I say coaching to be sensitive. But I need us to understand at the church, we need to understand that word is not a bad word. Can I say that again? It's not a bad word. It actually means the Lord loves us and he cares about us enough that we would have a chance to be changed. And so gentleness is important in this. We need to operate in gentleness. We need to walk in the gentleness that, we, that God has blessed us with. Men should be able to coach and correct other men in the church. Amen? Not many men said amen. Women should be able to coach and correct other women in the church. Amen? Do you know why that word correction creates an aversion? It's because we don't know how to do it gently. We don't know how to do it as good as we should. I've been corrected gently and I've been corrected hard in my life. I played football my whole life. I was a firefighter. If you cooked a meal and it was bad, they'd tell you that was terrible. Never do that again. And I've also had great gentle correction. And instead of breaking a plant, it was more trained up a trellis. And it was a wonderful thing. We should be able to do that with each other and not have that 95% of population go, I don't like that word. They'll go, you know what? I love that word because it's going to make me stronger. It's going to make me grow better. It's going to make me grow taller. And one day there's going to be a beautiful bloom on the end of this plant. And all the birds of the field, and there'll be seeds that are created 30, 60, 100 times, will be able to multiply this plant that had some training. Amen. We got to be gentle in the process. Can we give the Lord a hand clap for that tonight? <laughs> gentle in the process. I'm preaching to myself. Amen. Now that doesn't apply being stomped on or ran over. It's really um, knowing when to exit and how to exit a conversation um, that has no real eternal value. It's important. We don't want to be run over. Not, we, are, we are strong Christians with a backbone. Amen. Amen. I've talked about gentleness a lot. Let's go on to the next one. Kindness. Kindness. Man, I wish I were listening to myself today. This is a good one to have. Amen. I know some people that are incredibly kind. And there's a difference between nice and kind. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? I come from Kentucky. There's a lot of nice, kind, wonderful people. But when I came to Texas, it was a whole nother level. I mean, literally, I'm like at the boot barn the other day. At, uh, and people are like, I'm having trouble taking my shoes off. The people are so kind there, they would ask to take your boot off for you. Like, you want to touch my foot? You know, this is crazy. But the people are so kind. And that's the kind of kindness we need. But it goes to another level. It's a spiritual kindness. And that kindness is this, a sweetness of, of kindness of temper. I want that to be on my gravestone. Can someone make sure, Stevie, that he had a, a kindness and a sweetness of temper? That would be awesome. I want that. I'm going to have to earn it, Pastor Jesse says. I got a lot of work to do. Amen? It says this, it's the sweetness and a kindness of temper by which we accommodate ourselves and become mutually useful to each other. Mutually useful. This kindness calls us to serve everyone regardless of their feelings towards us or our feelings toward them. It's more of a mindset, really, and, and uh, I'm, goodness actually goes really well with that. I'm going to talk about it here in just a second, but the Holy Spirit within us helps us to choose kindness. Helps us to be kind to people. Amen? It is our expression and it's our posture towards God and his creation. 
That is kindness. There's a beautiful scripture. Jesus said it, Matthew 5, 11. It says, blessed are you when they revel you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you and falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Before you, It's really hard to obey Jesus and to respond kindly to people when they persecute you. You feel like it's almost merit for you to behave a certain way towards them, but God even calls us to still be kind to them. He says, bring them a glass of water. It's like, it's like heaping coals on their head, really. So if you want to do something to them, give them a glass of water. Bless them. Be kind to them, even in the midst of that, because what you'll do is you'll change that person's heart. You'll change their heart. It'll be a beautiful thing. Amen? It goes right into the last one. I'm kind of running out of time tonight, so I want to get through this last one. It's goodness. Goodness is a, a quality or state of doing something or producing good. The quality or state of being good. Performing acts of kindness and charity, uh, goodness implies generosity. Generosity, our willingness to help others generously. Kindness is that kind of concept. You're conceptualizing, I want to do good. I want to speak good. I want to say good things. Goodness is actually stepping that out and carrying that out. Doing good. Amen? And we're called to good to do good. This goodness comes in the form of giving away. It says, how can I help? And then it manifests in action. That's goodness right there. I love that. Goodness says, how can I take what God has given me and help others? It's walking out your kindness. It's walking out your gentleness. That is goodness. And God's calling us to do these things. You know, when you face various tribulation, when you face the thing Jesus said will come against you, when you face these different things, you can combat all of these things with the attributes, with the fruit of the Holy Spirit. He gives us liberally. But, you've got, but we've got to make a choice to do it. We have the choice to do these things. There's a withholding. There's a withholding. People would hold back these things, but, but I almost see it like a floodgate. And it's like almost like a lake. It's like doors opening up on a lake uh, that have been shut forever. And that's just all the love of Christ, all the goodness of God, just ready to pour out on the situation. Rivers of living water to be poured out on the situation. Your tribulation, if you would just open the door. That's a prophetic word for someone in this room. Would you close your eyes? Would you bow your heads for one moment? Rivers of living water, rivers of living water, rivers of living water. It will come out and it will extinguish all, all the fiery darts, all the flames of the enemy. It'll extinguish it all. Your life will be changed. Everything will be changed. If you would just open those doors. Don't withhold any good thing, the scripture says. Don't withhold any good thing, the scripture says. Let it rain. Let it rain. Let it rain. Let it rain. Come on, God's going to begin to do that in your life if you just open those doors. Lift your hand to heaven if right now the Lord's ministering to your heart. Just go ahead and lift your hand to heaven. God's doing something in this room. He's changing the attitude. He's changing your situation. He's changing your heart. He's changing the situation. Don't let your heart be turned to stone right now. Allow it to be moldable and to be pliable. Hey, listen, if you're facing an unexpected situation, I encourage you even right now, it doesn't, it doesn't matter who's looking, it doesn't matter how our service is flowing right now, I want you to come out of your seat and I want you to come to this altar and get on your knees and just thank God that He's already done it. Begin to come from all over this room right now. Just come now, come now, come to the altar now, right now, and just submit to the Lord tonight and say, I'm submitting to you in your Holy Spirit. Right now, just begin to come. Just begin to come if that's you. God's wanting to break open the doors, church. Yes, Jesus. If you have your prayer language, just begin to lift it up. If you don't have that, just be filled, or you can pray in your understanding right now. You can pray in your own language. Do what only you can do, Lord. Do what only you can do, Lord. Lord, we bless you. We thank you in Jesus' name. We honor you. Just lift your hands. Whatever one stand in the room right now, right where you're at, just stand. Just stand up all over this room. I want to pray with you right now. I want to believe that God's going to do a miracle in your life. And, and this altar is open right now. Our service is going to end here in a moment. And, and if you feel, hey, that was me. I needed to come to the altar. You can come to the altar and you can just kneel here. We'll continue to, we'll continue to play keys in this room right now and just have a, have a moment with God. 
and we can dismiss you here in one moment. Father God, we just thank you. I bless every single person under the sound of my voice. And I ask, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you would begin to open the floodgates of the fruit of the Spirit upon us. I pray we would, I pray we would accept what Christ left for us. We'd walk in it. We'd follow it now in the name of Jesus. Chains are being broken in this room right now. Chains are being broken in this room right now. God's doing it right now, Lord. We thank you and we bless you, Father God. They will operate in these fruits, Father God. We will not withhold them. In the name of Jesus Christ, we bless you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, and the church said, amen, amen. Let's give the Lord a big hand clap tonight. Come on, church.